And so as we look at uh, some of the research we've done previously, and what we want to do on the next set of, a few set of uh, experiments is talk about nursery pigs and basically looking at acidification or buffering and why we have really as an industry, we're certainly not the only ones that have been looking at how to create nursery diets that have a lower buffering capacity or basically the ability of that young pig after weaning to acidify its gut more effectively and if we have a lower pH or we feed ingredients that don't fight that as much, we have a greater opportunity for gut health, digestibility, feed efficiency improvements. So that's what I really want to get at. This effort really started AJ Warner's here. AJ's with uh, New Fashion. Last year we had a number of his projects as part of this. Ethan Stass has been, a, has been providing exceptional leadership in this area as well, both when he started on the end of his master's and now in his PhD. And one of the things that we had to do is establish from an ingredient standpoint, which ingredients may have more buffering or more positive that kind of work against that as the gut acidification versus what ingredients that we could include that may actually help with that that don't fight us in that regard. So what uh, Ethan was tasked to do, there was some data out of Europe that helped establish a lot of ingredients but what we want to do is get a database of U.S. ingredients that we could publish, and we've done that now. Ethan spent a great deal of time in the lab looking at lots of different ingredients, and this is just a brief summary of all those that he went through. One of those we wanted to highlight was some of the soy protein uh, ingredients. And basically the way to think about these numbers, and these numbers may or may not mean anything to you, but the lower the number, the less buffering it has. So it's basically think about it almost on an acidic basis. Not that they're acidic, but it allows once fed in the diet, it doesn't have as high a buffering. It won't take as much acid for that, acid, for that pig to produce itself to reduce the pH of the feed to allow it to be digested at a greater rate or greater gut health. And what I wanted to point out here and we point out is we've done a lot of different soy products that are out there. And there's a range. And if we think back to maybe why we get responses in some trials versus others, there's lots of different refined soy products out there, okay? A lot of high quality products, many of you out here represent them, a lot of us feed them in all of our diets. It's hard to find, quite honestly. Many starter diets don't have some sort of refined soy product in today. The vast majority of our starter diets would. But there is some differences, and in particularly, I'm going to talk about a soy protein concentrate in a couple experiments from now that's much lower lower than that so we can group these products but also we got to kind of get down to what different manufacturers have because all of a sudden things get thrown in the same bucket so want to point that out there's certainly variation in our soy protein products one of the things we need to really recognize is that minerals can serve as a very high buffer and in fact this is where we probably as an industry I think over the last three four years have learned as much as anything looking at that first two phases or at least till we get pigs to 25 pounds how some of these minerals really work against us in terms of trying to have a diet that with a lower buffering capacity so that baby pig again can have a can consume that feed produce the right amount of hydrochloric acid to get that feed down to the right pH one of those is certainly that very common that's in every swine diet is limestone or calcium carbonate, very high buffering capacity. It's a calcium charge, and the more calcium that we have in the diet, the, the higher the buffering capacity of that diet. And this is why for many of you in the room, many of our producers, that maybe you don't see the formulations, your nutrition company or we help, over the last few years, for the vast majority of starter diets for the first two phases or up to 25 pounds have had a reduction in the amount of calcium that's in those diets because of what we've learned and kind of uh, been able to identify of maybe one of the things that's working against us for those young pigs to digest food as efficiently. One of the things we've also learned is making sure we're accounting for all the calcium. There's a lot of additives, there's a lot of uh, packs, there's a lot of different things that get molded into these starter diets. And one of the things that always gets listed as carriers is what, Wayne? Limestone, uh, other products, and sometimes if we're not fully accounting for that calcium, all of a sudden it was two, three, four pounds more of limestone in that diet that we didn't even that we're not accounting for. So now instead of a calcium that we're trying to formulate for is 0.8%, we're over 1%, and that's a problem, 
Okay? I would say as an industry, we've done a very good job the last few years of recognizing that, watching our calcium, because it was cheap. And so it was, there couldn't be any harm of putting more. Well, in fact, there probably is. The other one is zinc oxide itself. So again, we utilize zinc oxide very effectively in the U.S. and, and certainly in other places around the world, but it carries a very high buffering capacity. And so we're going to use this as kind of a little bit of a segue to some of the research going on is if we balance diets more correctly, and, and zinc oxide certainly provides us a lot of gut health benefits and growth performance those first couple weeks. Uh, it, you know, it's kind of death taxes and zinc oxide. It used to be death taxes and paline, but since we can't use that, I like to shift to zinc oxide. You know, that constant response we get, but are we getting as good a response if we're using other ingredients with high buffering and does that affect? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But our monocal sources, our pho phosphates are much lower. So one of the things that we wanted to do was look at different diets with different calcium phosphorus ratios. And again, the way to think about it is a higher number represents a higher buffering. So as a pig would consume that feed, it would need to produce more hydrochloric acid in its gut to bring the pH down. Okay, And so again, as we look at a higher calcium phosphorus ratio or more calcium in the diet, logically when, when Ethan did the, the chemical analysis in the lab, there are higher values as we go down. The one thing that I also want to point out, so again from left to right, higher to lower. The one thing I also want to point out is even if we take all the individual ingredients and get them measured, then mix them all together, it should match up, right? Because we're just for, it's like formulating a diet. Well, what this also shows is it's not exactly that case. In fact, uh, the actual, once, we, once Ethan, I say we, Ethan titrated the uh, hydrochloric acid mix, it actually well, it produced a little lower value. So again, the, the message here is we need to continue to evaluate our ingredients, and then as we mix them together, the additivity of what actually is in the diet. So again, just some things, and we're going to continue to work in this area. One of the things that, that follows in, and we were fortunate to do a, a project with New Fashion, was actually looking at the acid binding capacity of different diets using some specialty soy products with and without zinc oxide. So as I just set up, zinc oxide's high, different soy products can have some variation. We wanted to see kind of in those in combination what we can accomplish. So I'm not gonna, none of us are gonna have had a lot of procedure slides, but I just wanted to point out again a commercial study a low ABC4 diet without zinc oxide, but with this novel soy protein concentrate. Actually, uh, the AX3 product actually has a negative number. If you remember back to the soy protein concentrate I showed a few slides ago, was I think six, 700, somewhere in there. So again, a product that was, that's made, a lot of variation out there in some of these ingredients, but we, they found one that's low. So to get us a low ABC4 diet or high, use a regular enzyme-treated soybean meal, and then we had a factorial with uh, high levels of, of zinc oxide as well. So what we have here on the left, what I want to start with, again, uh, got, don't want to get too into the weeds too much data. Why don't we first look at this first blue bars, looking at no zinc oxide added into the diet so we do not have the pharmacological levels. When we fed the low ABC4 diet versus the high, okay, we had a separation or improvement with the low ABC4, and this was all in an interaction, so that's why it's really driving that, that sort of effect. Now when we do add soy, uh, zinc oxide in the diet, we really didn't have a change between those two, but what I do want to point out is when we fed the low ABC4 with no zinc oxide, we're approaching or really close to the same performance with simply the, the, the low with added zinc oxide. Or how do we look at non-zinc oxide diets? There's a lot of things going on. Low protein, fiber source, name all the things. How do we look at these diets from an ABC4 standpoint to help maybe achieve some of those results? As we look at removals and mortality, uh, again, this was a commercial study, so this was a combination of mortality and removals from those pens. Again, we had an interaction going on, but as we look here in the no-zinc oxide diets, or no pharmacological levels, there was still the baseline of the trace mineral premix. We had, a, again, this interaction's mainly driven off a reduction in mortality and removals in the low ABC diet compared to the high ABC diet when no zinc oxide was fed. So again, as we look at approaches, well, if we get in the situation, and we will at some point in the U.S. of removing our high levels of zinc, some of these formulation techniques are going to have to come into play. 
Next, I want to move into, uh, if you remember back to Johnson's grid, one of the most, uh, you know, one of the categories that give the potential highest performance and with a lot of uh, studies out there is the use of acids, okay? This is not new work. Many of you, and uh, you know, it's again, back to the producers, the diets you feed, nutritionists here that formulate, it's very common to find some sort of acidifier, an in-feed acidifier, in a lot of our starter diets. What we wanted to do is take that information, and, and you'll see in the next uh, few uh, experiments, looking at different types, of, uh, of uh, acids that we can include in. And this is again the uh, National Pork Board. We had this large feed efficiency project. They funded uh, uh, work that helped continue now to take work, what we identified from Johnson's, now do some more testing of those in some different situations. So we first looked at uh, the benzoic acid of the Viva Vitel product of uh, DSM and appreciate John and, and their group for donating product for this uh, research. What we did is across here in phase one, we either had none, we either had a half percent all the way across. In phase two, we had a half, 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 down to a quarter percent. Then in phase three, so basically 25 pounds and above, again, we had our negative control. We kept the half percent inclusion, went from half down to a quarter, or removed it after it's been fed. And so again, the goal here was to look at regimen. Most, again, if people are using acids in their diets, most of the time it's included in the first two phases. Some do it in the third, but probably not very many, okay? And there's very little data to show during those common periods, or people will have a common period, but they don't have a regimen during that 25 to 50 pound uh, feeding period. So that's what we wanted to try and accomplish here. And what we showed was, and this is the overall final nursery body weight, from the negative control at 45 pounds, again, there were statistical differences where when we fed the, the half percent and a quarter percent, all the way to the end was statistically higher than the control, or in this case, when we actually removed it, we were somewhat back down. And, and again, I'll be honest, as we look at this data, this, to me, needs more follow-up. It looks like a little anomaly you wouldn't expect because those pigs gained a lot. They just kind of fell off, but when we took that high level off. So we could say, well, that's just not right, right? They should be better. Or is there something when we feed a high level and we remove, and this is same with other additives, do we need to more of a transition versus high to nothing? And that happens a lot in our industry. We go from high to nothing. Where is that line that we need to maybe look at? But again, helped us determine, all right, in phase three, we probably need to be looking at that a little bit more. And what happened then too is when feed conversion. So again, our negative control, when we fed uh, the levels um, at the half percent and a quarter percent, again, statistical improvements uh, from that, as well as when it was completely removed at the end when pigs had been fed different regimens during phase one and two. So again, a little bit more knowledge for us to look at and probably uh, we need to continue to look at that in that 25 to 50 pound pig when we have fed them earlier in the nursery. We took the same approach to finishing. So uh, Caitlin as well, uh, we had a project uh, that we worked at New Horizon Farms and uh, appreciate Dan being here in his leadership as he's taken leadership role at New, at New Horizon. And what we have is in this case for the entire finishing period, so starting these pigs, I believe it was around 60, 70 pounds, all the way to market, uh, we had either zero, quarter, and half percent uh, benzoic acid. And what this first slide shows is actually the average daily feed intake. As we fed more benzoic acid, we had an increase in the amount of feed intake. Uh, it was a tendency, a linear tendency, but mainly driven once we got to the higher level. If we look, however, at final body weight, there was no statistical differences. And so we did that feed, extra feed that they consumed in this particular case in finishing, didn't drive a statistical difference. Yeah, they were a pound heavier, but again, not close on a statistical basis in, in our commercial setting here with good replication. So from a finishing conversion standpoint, everything I just talked to you about acids and better digestibility should give us more better feed conversion. In most cases, in nursery in particular, we'll find acids, again, lots of variation, more often than not could give us a slight improvement in feed conversion. In these group of finishing pigs, it got worse. They ate more, 
but they didn't put down more body weight. And so this would be back to the bucket of variation. This is why we get so frustrated at times with feed additives. And, and as we've talked with, uh, you know, John and others about it, you know, these diets had, were a little higher in crude protein. There's a lot of things. Was it the way the diets were made as a baseline that didn't allow it? Or do we just look at this day and say, geez, we shouldn't feed this stuff and finish it? Because we could easily do that, but like data, either you decide to stop doing data to, to just be done, or you want to add to it. Jenna Brown, again, part of the pork board, we worked with Pipestone Nutrition, they were a partner in this, where we actually did a study looking at extruded soybean meal and regular soybean meal in a factorial with uh, benzoic acid. And the reason we looked at extruded soybean meal, there was a number of producers looking at with, as Bob talked about, the added fat, the high cost of fat, is there any advantage if a producer who raises his own beans should process them through an extrusion process, peel some oil off, still have a 7-8% fat soybean meal, retain ownership on it, if we want to use that word, and then feed it, okay? And so that's kind of why we threw a couple different things at it. Well, we'll find from average daily gain first, and there's no differences um, for whether it was soybean meal source or benzoic acid in this factorial. But if we look at feed conversion, there was no interaction, but soybean meal source, as expected, it was a higher energy diet. We did not balance the diets for equal energy. We wanted the extra energy from the extruded soy to show its effect, and it did on feed conversion. But if we look at benzoic acid, in either case, we had a statistical improvement when we compared benzoic acid versus not. So in this study, we just got the feed conversion benefit. The one I just told you before is actually the other way. Okay, again, but different diets, different environments, different things going on. One of the things that we wanted to show in, on a caloric conversion basis, and this supports the feed efficiency, what I want you, what we really want to take from this is if you look in soybean meal and extruded soybean meal, comparing the blue to the red, we had a decrease in this number. So it's like feed conversion. Or when benzoic acid was in these diets, those pigs actually converted the calories that they were fed more efficiently. So, Again, back to why do we get a feed conversion benefit in this case? They simply utilized it better. So this is worth, as we did talk about high level, did these acids work or not in these different, what else is in the rest of the diet? Why did, maybe did we do something different here that we didn't in the other to allow? And I think as we all do research, we need to be looking at base diets as much as the test ingredients and trying to help figure that out. So the last acid study I want to talk about is, is use of sodium diformate. Again, uh, Caitlin was involved with this. Holden Farms allowed us to use their facilities. And again, uh, this was a, a sodium diformate. Thank uh, Troy and his group for donating product as part of this pork board project. And basically what we wanted to do in this case was look at, again, in finishing, um, 0.25 to 0.75% um, inclusion. And what, and final body weight, again, starting them at about 60, 70 pounds. Uh, obviously, here we went to 310, so heavy market weights. Nice linear improvement all the way up through 0.75. And again, in that case, we got over three and a half pound advantage in body weight to that highest level. And that was driven by feed intake. So similar back to the first study with benzoic acid, we had an increase in feed intake in that study, which did not lead to improvement in feed conversion. This one we increased feed intake and they gained more, okay? And in this case, because they ate more, they gained more, feed conversions flat. So again, different responses, but again, as we kind of put this puzzle together, things to be thinking about as we go forward, okay? I want to shift gears and talk about some protein source work that we've been doing. One of those is done by Johnson and, and we, uh, APC and Joy Campbell and their group were partners looking at the use of bovine plasma with or without zinc oxide. Especially as you get to different parts of the world as we get into zinc challenges with high levels, what are we going to do to overcome the, the non-having of zinc oxide in diets? So that was really the goal of, of this particular study. So what I really want to get to is we fed plasma in, in phase one and two with or without high levels of zinc. And what I want to do on day zero to nine, if we just compare the dark bars here compared to the pink bars, they were increased. That was an increase in average daily gain, which is probably a typical plasma response initially after the pigs are fed. So we were getting a, you know, it was a trend, but again, we're moving in that right direction, driven off of feed intake. 
However, as we get to the end of the, uh, the period, day 24, we lose statistical advantages. Uh, and again, sometimes plasma effects stay with, sometimes they don't, but we got the pigs up on feed a little bit better. The thing here that we tried to do is, can we feed plasma and overcome not having zinc? That did not happen in this particular study. There is data to support that. In ours, it didn't say that we could just use plasma, not use zinc, and go forward. But again, more work to be done of how we overcome uh, low zinc in diets. To follow up on some of the vitamin work, Larissa Becker was involved in a study looking at folic acid inclusion in nursery feed, again, with or without high levels of zinc. There was a study that came out last year uh, by Wang that fed levels from zero to 18 parts per million and saw an improvement when we fed folic acid in the nursery. Um, again, there's very little data on individual vitamins. And so what we want to do is follow up fed zero, 20, or 40 and again, high levels of zinc oxide in that interaction to see if folic acid can improve, can we get by with feeding less zinc oxide, okay? Well, as we went across, uh, there was no interactions, but zinc oxide uh, gave us an effect on average daily gain when you compare the light versus dark bars. The interesting thing, though, in folic acid, and again, to put it in relative uh, amounts, uh, feeding additional zero, um, the when people supplement, when Jamil talked about including folic acid in diets, it's generally about two to five parts per million, okay? So if you're a producer out there and you have folic acid in these diets, it's probably somewhat in that range. Again, we're feeding much higher levels, but what we found is decreases at 20 and equal at 40. So again, more work is we probably didn't, uh, wasn't clean responses. We didn't replicate what Wang and, the, and found out of Asia in those trials. But again, uh, we wanted to kind of continue to look at, at this area. One of the things that generally gets measured, and I've glossed over, I haven't had time to speak about all the diarrhea scores it gets done. So again, the fun of a grad student is to uh, uh, have a good trigger finger uh, to collect feces, and then we do dry matters or fecal scorings, and, and we've all been there doing that. And ultimately, again, in this particular case, and I guess just really want to summarize, in the majority of studies, not all, Zinc oxide helps make a firmer stool, and that's one of the advantages of what it does gut-wise, stool-wise, less scouring. It's why it gets used a lot of times. Generally, we find that, and generally, we find a lot of other additives, things we do, don't have a major improvement in that. So again, if you're using fecal measurements as a scoring, that's kind of where we're at. One of the things we want to recognize is, is the Cargill group, the sweetener group up in uh, Blair, Nebraska. They've been involved with us a lot with research, trying to look at some of their functional corn proteins as a way to improve growth post-weaning. So again, we talk about soy products all the time, animal products. As we continue to look at some of the corn products that may be available, uh, they've been involved with a number of R&D projects with us, and we wanted to uh, make sure that we uh, uh, talk about those a little bit. And so in, in this particular case, we just had a couple different modified corn proteins fed at different levels in phase one and phase two, comparing to enzyme-treated soybean meal. In this particular case is our control, again, a, a normal control diet. As we replaced that and fed more modified corn protein, uh, we had a quadratic effect where these middle levels actually gave us a response um, as we compare it within those levels and, and number-wise as we look back uh, to the negative control. From a feed efficiency standpoint, it was no better, but as we get to higher levels, it gets worse. And so again, that has to do with some of the branch chain amino acids. The, the, the amino acids of corn protein are not the same combinations as soy protein and animal protein. And again, at lower levels, we can get by pretty good. At higher levels, feed conversion strayed. One of the things that we want to, one of the last studies I want to talk about is uh, Jenna Brums did a lot of work with uh, the NBO3 product, uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Last year we talked about two different studies, and one of those was done at New Fashion Pork, where this product was fed in, the nurse, in their commercial nursery, and then pigs started converting or got infected with PERS about three to four weeks into the nursery. And in fact, in that data, when this product was fed, led to a reduction in mortalities and removals and improvement in body weight at the end. To follow that up in the field more, uh, we worked with Josh in, in the Seaboard group um, to look at this product, again, in, in a further field situation. In this particular case, 91,000 pigs were used in this particular study, evaluating pigs that went into different barns 
And basically at that point we fed zero or three percent of the trial feed, 40 rooms per treatment. Me we're able to measure uh, uh, their growth performance as well as some of the per status as well as medication usage. The one thing that was different in this study compared to New Fashion was is that as, we, as, they, as per status was measured, 76% of the rooms tested positive within one week of, of placement, okay? So again, they didn't have a chance to consume the feed of this, of the omega-3 fatty acids very long or if at all prior to becoming infected. And in this particular case, we did not have an influence on growth. Feeding this product actually increased total removals and mortalities. There was a little bit of difference of how we look at number of injections. There was no difference, but it did decrease total injections per pig's place. So again, depending on your metrics, how you're looking at medication use, injection, labor, again, uh, more work to be done in this area. It's, uh, it's products that we're continuing to look at. How do we improve immune status, health status of pigs? And this would probably tell us, again, based on our conflicting commercial data sets, is there a period of time a product like this needs to be in the diet before the pigs become infected so they're prepared for it versus they already have it and then it maybe doesn't provide the benefit we've seen in other cases. Whew. That's it of the pig data for this morning. All right. Couple last things and we'll get to lunch. Want to, want to acknowledge uh, this last week we form, finalized uh, an arrangement with Cimarron Trailers. We were needing, uh, our, our, at our swine farm, we have a, a trailer that gets used for a lot of different things between hauling animals in for teaching, hauling our, our, our sale animals uh, where we need to at times or for research, and uh, that trailer was needing replaced. And so Ben Jansen with Cimarron Trailers is a, is a case stater through and through. He's president of the company. They have operations mainly in Oklahoma. They recently purchased a manufacturing facility here in Manhattan that was formerly with another group. So they're manufacturing uh, trailers in town. We visit with them and they're going to donate a, uh, a new stock trailer to our animal science department and um, that will be used solely really at the swine farm and some other units be housed at our farm shop. And so we really appreciate that partnership that we've been able to start and really great people as part of that group. So again, uh, they'll be making trailers right here in Manhattan uh, along with their Oklahoma operations. One thing I want to mention is our Swine Profitability Conference. Uh, it is held, uh, it'll be held at the Stout Center, so just on our north side of our campus in one of our livestock facilities, uh, conference facilities, Tuesday, uh, February 7th. Have a great lineup of speakers and, we'll, and you'll be getting information shortly on that speaker lineup uh, that we have coming in and just want you to get that down. Is really our other public event that we host as part of our Swine